Good morning, everyone. Good to see all your wonderful, beautiful faces. And uh, I don't know about you, but I know that um, that moment of worship was very holy and very special. And um, as we were worshiping, I know sometimes we're coming into a building like this and we've got all our different challenges and some of us are experiencing some highs, some of us lows, some of us in between. Uh, but regardless of where you may be in the journey, there's something so beautiful about the people of God that humble themselves uh, in worshiping our Father in spirit and truth. And Jesus said he's seeking true worshipers in these days that will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And I believe it's in those moments that we begin to experience just glimpses of God's glorious nature, his beauty, his presence, um, and he gives us perspective and it's in worship that uh, the atmosphere begins to change. You begin to see a little bit of what the Lord is wanting us to see. And when we understand that he is indeed the name above every, every name, every famous person, you name it, those who've gone before us, that Jesus is still the undefeated champion of the world and he's at work in you by his precious Holy Spirit and he loves you, loves you with an undying love. And so you deeply, deeply loved. Every single one of you, everyone online, Jesus loves you. This I know for the Bible tells me so, amen. Well, we land our series called Wisdom. Uh, we may be talking about wisdom over the next couple of years. I believe it's always something in the heart of God for us. But just in terms of the book of Proverbs, um, we complete our series today. And we've been talking about living wisely in the world, living wisely, being competent, with regards to the realities of this world and understand the realities of God's order or the realities of a broken world and how God has come in and how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and understanding His word, His will, His ways uh, in a world that desperately needs the beauty uh, of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. And so we're gonna talk about uh, wisdom uh, relating to our family life, our family relationships. And I believe this is so important for all of us. Wise people know the importance of family. And we also know a wise person can walk through very challenging seasons in their family life. And yet God wants us to look at his word and say, okay, Lord, how can you give me wisdom? Regardless of what stage we may be in, Lord, give me wisdom in how I can have a wise family life. And so we're gonna focus on three areas of relationship, husband to wife relationships, parents to children relationships, as well as children to parent relationships, and just see what God's word says in and around these areas. Now obviously, because we've only got so much time, there's no ways we can uncover such a huge topic. In fact, we could just focus on the husband and wife relationship, but as we land the series, we're gonna look at some key areas that Proverbs highlights. And before I go there, just wanna honor Patrick and Daphne Banda, who've been part of our church for many years. They've just, they um, celebrate their 33, 33rd anniversary today. And so can we give them a big, big hand? <clears throat> Bless you guys, we love you. And just thank you for your love and prayers and just what you guys do in this house. Well, as I talk about this life, I can, family life, I recognize that all of us at different stages and some of us, um, maybe going through the fire right now in terms of your family, whether it's your marriage or your relationship with your parents or vice versa, whatever it may be. And may the Holy Spirit bring some comfort, some direction uh, to you this morning. And so we're gonna look at in the most general way uh, some of the basic principles of family life that are found in the book of Proverbs. As a congregation, I recognize some of you are married, some of you are not married. Some of you are married and have children. Some of you are married and do not have children, or you do have children, but your children are no longer in the house. Uh, you empty nest, it's the empty nest syndrome, as they would call it. And yet, I believe, regardless of what stage you may be in, uh, the themes that we can look at uh, are universal and can be applied to every single one of us. I also just wanna say a shout out to Professor David Block. I just know a little bit of what he's gonna be sharing uh, to us as a congregation next Sunday, and I believe it's a beautiful way to also land uh, this series around wisdom uh, and also on relationships. 
So do everything you can to come along and hear the word that the Lord has laid on his heart. What does Proverbs say about the relationship of husband to wife? Relationship of husband to wife. Well, let's look at Proverbs 2, verse 16 and 17, and it says this. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. And so this is a relationship between husband and wife. It could be the man, it could be the woman. Uh, but the bottom line is here, it's talking about someone who's ignored the covenant. And so here Proverbs is very clear in terms of the beauty of marriage, the beauty of a covenant relationship. That marriage is based on a covenant. And it's one flesh. Covenant is... Um, It's a binding agreement. It's also where two become one flesh, a beautiful union between husband and wife. And when you think of a wedding, a wedding is not just about legalizing something. Just wanna honor somebody I deeply love at the back, Doug and Vanessa Fortain, being part of this house for, well, over 20 odd years, 25 years, also an elder in our church, and just a real brother in the faith, and just love you guys. Um, Dora, I'll get you every single one of you before the end of the evening. Oh, my wife is helping me, saying, Chris, you've got to dress correctly. It's a new microphone, the, the microphone cable. Thanks, my lovey. Just by the way, your scarf can actually be balanced there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Lee. A wedding is a special day. Um, it was wonderful seeing uh, my beautiful daughter is now engaged to a wonderful guy called Joshua, and they'll be following that whole process. <clears throat> and a wedding is obviously not about just the legal process. It's not just about signing a legal paper. It goes far beyond that. It's not just about a declaration of your present love to the person you're about to enter this beautiful journey called marriage, but it's also promises about a future love, promises of a future love. If you listen to any wedding ceremony, regardless of really any culture, you'll hear these beautiful vows being given from husband and wife. And uh, it's not just about their feelings, their present love, but it's also about their behavior and promises to be tender, promises to be considerate, promises to stand there through every trial, testing, temptation, difficulty, regardless of the circumstances and how we feel at the time, what we're making is a promise, a vow, that I'm gonna stand with you through it all till death do us part. And so the vows keep you together despite the ups and downs and the changes that would try and end a normal relationship. And again, as I'm saying this, I recognize that some of us have gone through some challenges in our marriages. Some of us have marriages that have ended and there's always God's redemption and restoration when any two people always look to Jesus, the restorer, the forgiver, the healer to help us in the journey as we follow him. But so marriage is a covenant, a lifelong journey strengthened by our vows, a one flesh agreement. Not only does the book of Proverbs talk about the fact that marriage is a covenant, but also that it is a ministry, it's it's a ministry, a ministry mindset. It's based on two people that desire to help one another, to serve one another, to minister to each other. And so Proverbs will also talk about two important factors that when they were given over, well, thousands of years ago, for people in those days, those cultures, it would have been um, uh, ref- reform, re- uh, revolutionary, that's the word I'm looking for, revolutionary for many people listening to some of these comments coming from this book of Proverbs. Uh, the first is that your spouse needs to be your lover. This is what Proverbs is saying to the people of the day. Hey, listen, your spouse needs to be your lover. Proverbs 5, 18, 19 says, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. 
And so here, the word captivated actually means to be intoxicated by her love. That you are so in love with your spouse. Here is a passionate love relationship between two people who are in covenant with one another. And so here, your relationship with your spouse should be characterized by love, romantic love, also sexual love. And so this was so historically different to what people were experiencing in those days because people in those days saw marriage not as a love relationship really because in traditional societies for many, the purpose of marriage was to gain security and and, and, uh, status for your family, to gain security and status for your family. So both husband and wife were trying to marry as well as possible. You married the person who helped your family status the most and who produced children. But no one really married for love or romance. That's, you, that's something you got outside of the marriage. You looked for romantic joy outside of the marriage. People married for status and for children. But yeah, Proverbs says, listen, marriage is for love. It's for love. Your spouse should be your lover. Second principle that uh, Proverbs will also highlight that your spouse should be your friend, should be your friend, an equal. Different roles, but equals. And Proverbs 2.17 says, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she has made before her God. And so the word partner in this context means an intimate, close, best friend. Here, your partner needing to be your best friend. And so here, Proverbs says your relationship with your spouse should be one of love, but also of friendship, your best friend. Two weeks ago, we talked about what wisdom or Proverbs talk says about the marks of true friendship, the building blocks of a friendship where there needs to be constant availability, that you're available to one another through all seasons, that you're careful, there's a sensitivity, this candor where you can speak truth in love to one another. There's also counsel where you can confide in one another, counsel and com- comfort one another, as well as there will be repenting and forgiving in the whole journey of friendship. This, in the culture of the day when Proverbs is given, was also quite amazing because women had a very low status and they were mainly seen as possessions and childbearers. But here, Proverbs calls your spouse to be your best friend and in covenant with one another. And so, Proverbs is calling for both. What happens when lovers become best friends? It's precious, it's beautiful. Can accomplish so much more together when a couple love one another and are close friends. And when you combine those two, you have a holy chemistry, I believe. A relational chemical connection. There's something beautiful and precious about it. Not only are you attracted to one another, but also you focus on common interests, just like we talked about the essence of friendship, where there's a common affinity, but also you're on a journey together as friends. And it's like you'd go on a hike to one an, uh, uh, with one another, and you go on a hike to the mountains, and you've got this beautiful destination, you fellow tra- travelers on the journey, helping each other reach the destination, also enjoying the journey. And so I believe what happens is when you have a passion for one another and also a friendship, uh, you go towards, you're there to help each other reach their fullest potential. That we, we one together and I'm gonna help you become everything you can be as you're helping me become everything I can be. We committed to each other's potential, the growth, and that we're gonna play a part in ministering to one another in getting to that journey, that destination. Traditional marriages will say, listen, you get married for, for, for status. Uh, modern uh, society would say, get married just for personal fulfillment. Whereas the Bible says, uh, you think of Jesus and the gospel. Think about how Jesus has treated you and me, how he treats us as we're spouse, so to speak the bride of Christ, how he treats you, what happens. Here we're made in the image of God. We're made for something great, every single one of us, but we've been broken, damaged by sin. 
What does Jesus do? He looks down at us. He sees us that we are just shadows of what we were made to be, shadows of what we should be. He doesn't leave it there. Out of love for us, he comes into the world, lays his life down for us as a holy sacrifice, lives the life we should have lived, dies the death that we should have died. And here, through a sacrifice and what he does through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus makes it available forgiveness and a new life and a new heart and a reconciliation with our heavenly Father. And then he comes into our lives through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And he applies what has been done in and through the gospel of Jesus. And guess what? He goes on a journey with us. Goes on a journey with us to our future potential. Ultimately, our future glory. Something that awaits for us. And so he's at work in every one of us ministering to you as we worship him, ministering to us. And so once you and I understand the gospel and the good news of Jesus, it begins to revolutionize our understanding of marriage, that marriage in one sense is becoming a gospel reenactment of how Jesus treats us so we're gonna treat one another in our marriages. Why do you marry somebody? Well, obviously there's generally, it's a personal Chemistry, it's uh, an attraction. Generally, it starts with an attraction. But for a Christian, it goes more than just a physical attraction. It goes into uh, a deeper attraction because something's more important than physical attraction. Because as what a person gets older, and maybe your strength and your energy is not like it used to be when you're in your early 20s, and maybe your beauty is waning to some degree, even though our our, our youth is being renewed like the eagles, but there's a part where age kicks in, but there's something precious when you see a couple have walked through the different seasons and journeys of life, and their love has just grown deeper and deeper and deeper. There's this attraction that goes just beyond the physical attraction. There's something about they find the beauty of that person's love, of their heart, their courage, their humility, their sensitivity, their servant likeness, their servanthood. So you're not, and then another side of that attraction is it's not just that you're attracted to who they are, but also who they're becoming in the journey. That that person is also growing like you're growing, and we're together helping one another. And so when a Christian looks at another person, you think you're marrying. Here you realize I'm seeing flashes of your future and they excite me. I see the beautiful work that's begun in you. And as you've seen the beautiful work that's begun in me, what we're gonna do is we're gonna journey together. I wanna help. I wanna minister to you as you are ministering to me. I wanna be part of that journey. And so what that does is when we have that biblical perspective We don't have a consumer mindset that basically says, I'll be the spouse I should be to the degree that you are being the spouse you should be. And so if you're not being the spouse you should be, I don't have to be the spouse you should be. If you're not performing, I'm not gonna perform. And that's obviously not the purpose of marriage. Purpose of marriage is not just about fulfillment, but it's also about ministry. And so covenant relationship is where it says this, I'm gonna be the spouse I ought to be even when you're not being the spouse you should be. Why? Because my ultimate, my ultimate lover, my ultimate spouse, Jesus Christ, treated me like that. When I didn't perform and I wasn't too great and I was saying things, doing things, how did Jesus treat me? He still loved me. And so he loved me not because I was necessarily lovely, lovely, but in order to make me lovely. And Paul the apostle will begin to talk about the beautiful relationship between husband and wife in Ephesians 5 verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And to here, it's not about me, but it's about us, and that we're in this journey together. You're out for the good of the person. Does that mean you allow the, your spouse just to walk all over you and there's not boundaries? No, we saw that even in the essence of friendship that you speak the truth in love, and as Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. 
Worst th possible thing you could do for a selfish person is to let the person just continue being s selfish because that's just gonna be destructive to them as well as your relationships. And many of us can relate to being selfish in our journeys. And here, there are gonna be moments where you're gonna need to confront in love. Yes, there's gonna have to be patience and grace and mercy and understanding, but what happens as a follower of Christ and when we're wanting to be people of wisdom, we understand it's not just about fulfillment, but it's also about ministry now. We're both growing. It's about covenant, it's about passion, it's about romance, but it's also about friendships committed to the journey. We could camp on that for very long, but that's what Proverbs is talking about, other things, but that key thing um, about our covenant and our ministry. What does the Proverbs say about relationship of parents to children? How should parents relate to children? Again, there's many other principles. Let's just look at one or two big ones. Traditional conservative society will say the main purpose of child rearing is control. You gotta take control and it's gotta be about strict discipline. Modern society will say that the main goal of child rearing is love and affirmation. That as a parent, we're gonna be loving and supportive and help the child, child do self-discovery. The Bible will say this, the main purpose and goal of parenting is yes, affirming and loving and supporting, and yes, a healthy dimension of the discipline, but is to make our children wise, for them to become secure adults um, and interdependent adults and become wise people. Proverbs 23 verse 22 <clears throat> says this, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she's old. Buy the truth and do not sell it, Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who, is far, who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. And so here, the main job of a parent is to teach your children well. Yes, no perfect parent, but you're teaching your children to the best of your ability under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to know what is good and bad, what is right and wrong, what is wise and unwise, to help them live wise lives, to understand also the foundation of having a relationship with God and His Word. Many of us who are maybe in our 20s or 30s or older will think, you know what, I don't necessarily remember every conversation with mom and dad of what they taught me and what is right and wrong. But what makes you capable of coming up with becoming a, having a mature understanding of right and wrong and, and, and good and bad and wise and unwise actions is the fact, not that your, fa your teachers, your parents taught you exactly right or perfectly, but the fact that they taught you and that they had an understanding of right and wrong. Yes, there were consequences to different things, but there was a love and affirmation. For some of you, as I'm saying this, you think, Chris, that wasn't my reality. I didn't grow up with that. Some of you had absent parents. Some of you had foolish and unwise parents. Some of you had wise parents, imperfect parents. Some got it right, sometimes didn't get it right. But the bottom line is here that Proverbs is talking about the, the responsibility of parents training your children, instructing them, teaching them well, being available to help them understand both the right and wrong. Proverbs 3 verse 11 will say this, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father, the son he delights in. So, from a parent's perspective, three things come to mind, instruction, delight, and discipline. These are three things that I believe in balance, something that we as parents need, need the wisdom of God to help us in our journey as parents. That God is calling us to direct and love our children. Yes, in discipline, but correct and healthy discipline, not done with anger and abuse. But behind it all needs to be a love and delight in your children. They feel loved and that you believe in the best. You see the potential. They are so precious and valued. They are gifts from God to you. And that you're gonna nurture them and do your best to protect them and love them. But this is what Proverbs also talks about. Not only are you gonna delight in your children, but folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. 
And so it would be foolish for any parent to think that every child's gonna grow up and just be perfectly wise. No, because in every human being, there's this also this natural self-centeredness and there can be foolishness within us. And sometimes this is where discipline comes in to help us understand how you break the rules, you pay the price in certain ways, understand the consequences sometimes to our actions. And this is where we intervene as loving, affirming parents with a healthy discipline. Um, discipline in this context is about coaching. It's about coaching. Remember the heart is that you're delighting and you love your children. You don't wanna break their spirit. You're wanting to nurture and affirm them, help them live wise lives. Understand they're gonna make mistakes like we've made mistakes. And that word rod actually means to take authority. This is not necessarily referring to corporal punishment, and I believe there's been great abuses with people taking the scripture fully out of context. It's taking authority, recognizing there's folly in the heart of a child, and sometimes it's gonna be healthy authority saying, no, no, you cannot do that. There are gonna be consequences to that. So one of the great dangers of reading the book of Proverbs without context is that you can think that it just means to, to smack or spank. It's not always referring to that. And I believe in those days there was a, a wisdom maybe that needed there, but it needed to come from a heart of delight. Because when you actually really love somebody, you don't want, there, needs to, there cannot be any abuse or anything like that. Proverbs 22 verse five says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Now what's important, some commentators believe this, that your discipline training fits the nature of your child. Just how every child, I look at Michael and Kayla, different personality types, totally. And yet both precious and valuable, made in the image of God, different love languages, how some children will relate more to more time, others words of affirmation, touch, service, gifts, etc. And so some children don't need corporal punishment in that sense. They just need a stern look. Others may, hey, listen, you're gonna need to go to your room because now you can't go to that party because you've just gone and broken the kitchen or whatever it is. And so in that moment, there needs to be wisdom and love, always done in an environment of love and delight. And catching your children doing the right things, affirming them, praising them, celebrating them, focusing in on their strengths, helping them in their self-esteem, self-image. Again, this is something, guys, because of time, we can't even camp on this. We've got beautiful uh, resources uh, in parenting children and teenagers, and uh, some of our group leaders run these resources and groups, so please get involved in that if you wanna know a little bit more around what the Word of God says in that. And then lastly, the relationship of children to parents, of children to parents. You'll see in the Bible, Proverbs as well as throughout the Bible, a particular word comes up again and again and again, and it's the word honor. And the word, the opposite of honor is to despise, is to despise. And Proverbs 15 verse 20 says this, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Proverbs 16, 15 5 says, a fool despises his father's instruction, <coughs> but he who receives correction is prudent. So there's that despising, the opposite of it is honoring. In the 10 Commandments, some of the basic principles of living life well is, um, says this in Exodus 20 verse 12, it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now it's not saying and you've got to necessarily admire your father and mother because some of you may have gone through some very harsh situations where it's been very difficult to admire um, your, your, your father or mother or trust your father or mother. But here, the Bible is saying, honor your father and mother. Regardless of the different stages, and some of us at different stages, to honor our parents. It's not saying that you've got to necessarily love them or admire them some of your parents are easy to love. Some of them, maybe it's been difficult. But some of us, uh, like I said earlier, have had some very challenging relationships with our parents. And some of us who are parents have understood that we've been challenging to some degree. 
When you're young, the Bible's clear about obeying your parents is crucial in terms of your development, otherwise it's a disaster. But as you grow, and as you grow up to become an adult, it's not that you now need to be obeying your parents and everything, otherwise that could be a disaster. Doesn't mean you don't value their counsel and their love and their support, but that the Bible is saying no matter what condition your relationship may be with your parents, some of your parents have passed on, that there needs to be an honor, that you're gonna honor them, that you're gonna respect them. You may not respect everything they've done, but you're gonna honor dad and mom. Proverbs says, don't despise, curse, or mock them. Listen to how strong it gets in Proverbs 30, verse 11 and 17. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. The eye that mocks a father that scorns an aged mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. It's pretty strong language, but just showing how God Almighty, the perfect Father, is saying, listen, there needs to be an honor that we've got to develop. We don't necessarily respect everything that's happened, but we're gonna honor them. And God is redemptive as we know. There's basic ways that we can honor and respect our parents, find ways to show them respect, maybe at holidays, special occasions, those phone calls, social media, just give me practical things. Secondly, don't underestimate your parents' need to see themselves reproduced in you. Give credit when credit is due. Just say, hey, dad, hey, mom, you know what, that trait, I got that from you. And I remember this, that you used to say this and that, and I believe in that, it also affirms and honors our parents. Don't stereotype them, people can change, just like we changing. And just because mom or dad may not have been perfect when you were a teenager, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I heard of one teenager, you're sitting with his dad, and his dad said, listen, I wanna teach you about the facts of life, and the teenager looked at his dad and said, dad, well, what do you wanna know? What do you wanna know? <laughs> but just because mom and dad may have not got it always right, um, by the time you got to 21, don't think that God's not at work in them and he's healing them and wanting to change them. Forgive them. Proverbs 20, 20 says, if someone curses their father or mother, uh, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. And one of the ways you honor your parents is you show forgiveness. You know, if we're gonna stay resentful towards our parents when we become grown adults, uh, you know what, you're showing a sign that you haven't fully grown up. You're still allowing some of those events to control you. I'm not saying those things weren't hurtful and caused great pain and damage, but God can heal. And as we spoke about last week, let's get rid of that, that resentment out of us. Forgive your parents. And then also to be liberated enough from them that you can stand strong in your relationship with the Lord, that you're now an adult who is responsible for your journey. Um, that you don't need their approval anymore. Yes, you regard their counsel and their love and their va you value that, of course, uh, but you're not needing their approval anymore. Otherwise, you're always gonna feel like you're having to live up to some of the expectations or live your life filled with resentment for not loving you or giving you all the time that you necessarily wanted, that you now can stand strong in your relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> so there are some principles that are around parents and children, children and parents, and husbands and wives. Now, as you've heard this morning, before we close in prayer, <clears throat> maybe someone's feeling like, Chris, what you've said today um, is hard for me. I find it very challenging to try and do this. And I think the only way we're gonna get help as we've looked in this series in the book of Proverbs, every time I trust you've heard the essence of this, and I thank uh, one of my mentors. I don't know Percy, Pastor Tim Keller, where I've drawn a lot of my content around from this. Um, but I trust that you've heard in this that the way we can truly live wise lives is when we have a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's no ways we can do this just through good willpower and good intentions. We're gonna need something far greater, greater revelation of what Jesus has done for each one of us in and through the gospel. So we look at the New Testament, we look at Jesus and see how Jesus helps us. <clears throat> to the person who may be saying, listen, I'm in a challenging marriage. How can you stay on a journey with a very difficult spouse? 
And I'm not talking about extreme cases, and, um, but here, maybe you're going through a difficult season right now. What, God, what would God want you and I to do when you're going through some of those challenging seasons? Like we saw earlier, how about the partner and how we need to value the covenant. That word partner, <clears throat> speaking of covenant, speaking of friendship. And here Jesus and the Father, perfect relationship, triune God and the Holy Spirit come up with a redemption plan. And Jesus makes a covenant with the Father to make us his partners that we will become Jesus' spouse and Jesus will be our spouse. But when he gets here, <clears throat> what happens? He's crucified. He's crucified. Maybe you think you're going through a challenging season right now, but Jesus' spouse did crucify him, if you think about it. Jesus got into the worst marriage, the marriage from hell. <laughs> what did I say? The marriage that sent him to hell was marriage with us in one sense. It cost him his life. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have made our fair share of mistakes. But do you see Jesus in his relationship with you? Sometimes when we haven't been too good, too pure, have you seen Jesus staying faithful to you even in so-called a terrible marriage where sometimes we've ignored him, insulted him through our actions and our words? But here Jesus, he brings us ultimate faithfulness, the ultimate spousal love, being faithful to us and being faithful to his covenant with us. Think about the love that Jesus had for us. Sees us in our mess, in our sin, says I will die and become, I'll go into covenant with them, become one with them. And yes, there'll be moments where we'll run astray and sometimes lose our perspective and then hurt ourselves and those we love, and yet He'll still stay faithful to us. What a good God. What a beautiful spouse. What a wonderful friend. Jesus, a wonderful friend. That gives us hope when you're going through a challenging season in your marriage. It gives you hope that I have the ultimate lover, the ultimate spouse. Now this is something that I think needs to, we need to drill a little bit deeper in here. If your spouse is the center of your life, the most important thing to you, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna be a lousy spouse. It doesn't mean you can't love your wife, love your husband with everything, and they're so important, so valuable, one of the key relationships in your life. You'll do anything for them. But you and I will be a lousy spouse if we make them the idol, the center of our lives. Because when your spouse has a terrible problem going through a challenging season in their life, whatever it may be, you're gonna be freaked out and so afraid because you're not gonna be strong for him or her. Why? Because they the sense, they the source of your worth, your significance and meaning and happiness. And so if they go, they're unhappy, then I'm gonna be unhappy. It's gotta be something bigger and stronger on the core of us. <clears throat> and your spouse is not giving you what you want you're gonna be so freaked out because your spouse is the ultimate source of your worth and significance and happiness. And so unless Jesus becomes the center of your heart, that Jesus becomes the source of your worth, your significance and meaning, the one that you ultimately put your hope and trust in, then you and I are not gonna be great spouses. But when Jesus is the center, He makes us great spouses. Yes, works in progress. Only if you let Jesus be your ultimate spouse will you be any kind of decent spouse yourself. You look at your spouse saying, you know what, you've sinned against me. You said that thing that you should have never said. Done that thing you should have never done. But I sinned against Jesus. He loved me and covered me anyway and I can love and cover you anyway. And so you and I are never gonna grow to be the spouses that we, never, we should be until we get that spousal love from Jesus that changes us from the inside. And He becomes the center of, of it all. <clears throat> Another side of this is obviously understanding God's grace and mercy, etc. And again, because of time, we can't get into some extreme cases, but I tell you, there are many testimonies here that can share about the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the love of God and how He's brought restoration. 
How can I handle the journey of life if I wanna be married and I'm not? Maybe there's someone here, you've gone to quite a few weddings and you always leave there, trying to be happy for that friend and yes, you rejoice with those who rejoice and yet there's a part of you just saying, hey, when is my day coming? Well, what I just said about spouse of love and Jesus being the ultimate spouse, ultimate lover, the same holds true for you. That you're gonna be a lousy spouse unless Jesus is the ultimate source of love and significance in your life. And He's that ultimate spouse who comes alongside you, whether you have help or not, but He's restoring and shaping you into reaching your full potential and your future glory. So when you're at a wedding, and you feel like, well, when is mine coming? Love this, say this to yourself. There's only one person in the universe who can give my soul what it longs for the most, and He awaits me. I can read about in Revelation 21 and 22. My wedding day is coming no matter what, and the only wedding day I really need. And that there's an ultimate lover, an ultimate spouse, who's committed to you for all eternity and will be secure and love you and be faithful to you and will never abandon you, never forsake you, never leave you, hold you in the arms that nothing can separate you from His love. So Jesus is the way, looking to Him and letting Him deal with our hearts to help us in our journey with our, our marriages and also those without a spouse. And to us as children, how can you look at your parents, whether they're still alive or not, and be free enough to not resent them or to not actually work too hard to please them. It's Jesus. Think about this. Jesus, perfect, harmonious relationship with the Father. The Father delights in Jesus, loves Jesus. Beautiful Father-Son relationship. But Jesus, because He loves you and this world so much, he loses the Father's delight so that we can have the ultimate Father's delight as He becomes the Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the world. That we can have that divine affirmation from the ultimate parent, the perfect, loving, merciful parent, saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And what that does is when we have a revelation of the Father because of what Jesus has done, that I am through Jesus, my way, the truth, and the life comes to the Father. It's through Jesus that I have a relation with the Father, that perfect parent who affirms me and loves me. That begins to do something so deep within our souls. And so it means we can look at our parents, as good as they are or as bad as they've been. And you can say this, you stood, mom and dad, in the place of God for me at one time. You were my complete source of significance and security. You were a complete source of my understanding of right and wrong. But you're not God to me anymore. Through Jesus, my true brother, I've come into the ultimate home and I have the ultimate approval of the ultimate Father. Now I'm free to honor you, free to forgive you, free to not over need you. I will honor my parents. And until then, you're not gonna be able to honor your parents until you and I have had that revelation that through Jesus, we have the ultimate parent who loves us. And I know that there are many parents watching online, many parents here, you've given it your best shot. And I wanna say, well done, and thank you. Keep on doing the good work. Yes, sometimes we've got it wrong, sometimes we've got it right. But the bottom line is we need you, moms and dads. We need you. But the deeper truth is this. Ultimately, we need the ultimate Father who's the ultimate source of our worth, significance, and happiness. Amen? That's real home. Real home. It's something we all desire. And sometimes in God's presence, we think, oh, I realize this is where creation is groaning, longing, ultimately, to be home. And we have that through the power of the Spirit. You know, kind of think of that movie, I've got to be careful of time. Like E.T., remember the famous movie E.T., E.T., go home, go home. 
something our hearts long for that's in and through a relationship with Jesus and we're experiencing glimpses and experiencing His presence and His love in the journey. We have the Spirit of God in us where the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart and what's happened inside of us needs to begin to renew our minds and our actions and our mindsets and help us love those around us as we're also learning to love ourselves. Can we pray? We worship you, Father. We worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming up with this plan, Lord, and bringing us into union and unity with you. That we are made in your image, that we are partakers of this divine nature, Lord, that none of us could earn or deserve. But because of your great love, your great grace, Lord, you make it possible for us to be united with you. We are sinners separated us from you. But because of Jesus and his blood, Lord, you forgive us and you give us a new heart and new life, new meaning, new purpose, new significance, new security, new freedom, because we know you. Lord, as we land this series and as we're gonna worship now, Lord, I know this wisdom comes from knowing you knowing your nature, knowing your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd give each one of us wisdom for each day. Lord, every day there's new things that are happening. and Lord, help us to be competent with regards to the realities of life as we look at it through the lens of your word and your presence. Give us wisdom, I pray. And Lord, we thank you, promise that you'll give it to us liberally, liberally generously. Make us a wise people in these days, in Jesus' name. Lord, I also thank you for your understanding and your mercy and your grace that you reach out to us, to every one of us, Lord, and these specifically for maybe someone just thinking it's too late to start again. I've just, it's just a path of damage behind me. And Lord, you look for hearts that come to you like the prodigal son, prodigal daughter, and Lord, you affirm us and love us. And Lord, bring us into a new path of redemption. Jesus, you come to save us and forgive us and renew us. Maybe there's someone right now that's all you're gonna do is call on Jesus. You've never made a personal decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Do it right now. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He loves you. He died for you. And he says, I wanna be one with you and live with you for all eternity. Just say, Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, be my Lord. Forgive me of my sin and take control of me and make me into the person you've created me to be. Amen. Amen. Can we stand? We're going to finish off with a beautiful song and uh, then prayer will be available to everyone. Let's run to the Father. Let's run to the Father, the great parent. Amen.
prayer team available to pray with you this morning if you need prayer god bless you have a wonderful sunday reminder that we have our next step with um growth point two so if you want to go there east wing god bless you we love you have a wonderful week